heard my top of the hour signal. So uh, we'll get started. And I'm Linda Harvey. And uh, today we're going to be talking about birds in the garden. And before we get started, we're going to have Cheryl uh, talk a little bit about what's coming up in um, the master gardening world in Denton County. So Cheryl, go ahead. All right, thank you, Linda. Good evening, everyone. Just wanted to take a one minute plug for a couple of items that we have exciting um, events coming up. So on April 23rd, we have our annual plant sale and that will be at the Trinity United Methodist Church on Hobson Lane in Denton. We're so excited to be able to have a plant sale in person again. Um, we've really missed it and miss seeing all of you. So hopefully you'll be able to join us for that plant sale. The other event we have is our annual garden tour. It's on May 7th. Uh, Saturday from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. What you're looking at here that uh, Linda has carefully put up for us is our um, website. So if you go to dcmga.com, you can click on either one of the links on the side and it will take you um, to more information about the plant sale or about the garden tour and you can purchase tickets. Um, for the garden tour. So um, please take a few minutes when you get a chance and uh, click on these um, sites and learn more about what we have coming up. And we hope to see you at both of those events at the 23rd of April and the 7th of May. Wonderful. Back to you, Linda. Thank you. Thank you, Cheryl. And go ahead and mute everyone so we don't have any background noise. So for our presentation, it is gardening for the birds. And uh, I'm going to be running the presentation tonight. Uh, Cecil Carter is with us. And I saw Cecil do a presentation for Ollie on this very same topic. And uh, his presentation was an hour and a half long. I made a, a shorter version for another purpose. And to fit our schedule tonight, I'm going to do that presentation. But Cecil is right here with me. Let me stop the share. And Cecil is uh, from the Native Plant Society, was the past president of the Trinity Forks chapter right here in Denton, as well as the state chapter of the Texas, of the National, excuse me, the Native Plant Society of Texas. So I should be sharing now our Gardening for the Birds presentation. And let's get started. We're going to hold the questions to the end. Uh, if you'd like, please put your questions or your comments in chat. And that way we can get to all of them and make sure we don't miss anything. So let's get started, Gardening for the Birds. So here are some birds that are in my garden. There's a hawk sitting out back in an oak tree. There's a blue heron who wants to have lunch in our pond. And uh, here's a few young cardinals. So in addition to having in common that they're in my yard, you can see that they all have a particular attitude problem. And unfortunately, we don't have enough time to talk about all of them today, but we're going to concentrate those in the lower right, uh, commonly known as the songbirds and the words that many do want to admire and attract to their yard. So we're going to concentrate on those birds. So our agenda is to go over the basic bird needs. And those are food, shelter, and water. Now the birds you see there, that is a picture from my yard. I use a Nikon N90, uh, D90 rather, um, digital camera. And those are cedar waxwings, and they're sitting in an oak tree. They are a migratory bird, and they come through in the winter, and you're going to see them a few more times. So let's go look at their basic needs of, of these songbirds. Oh, by the way, as we look, uh, some of the items we look at are going to provide more than one attribute, maybe food and shelter, or maybe food, shelter, and water combined. So we'll hit the highlights as we look at the different items that are in their basic needs. Let's start with food. There's our cedar waxwings once again. 
and they are in a possum haw holly this time in the front yard rather than the backyard. And they're, they're munching out together. Talk more about them. Bird food, common bird foods. These are the major groups of bird foods, seeds, and I think we all expect that. They also eat fruits and berries, and that indeed is what those seeds Sorry, I was muted there for a moment. I'm gonna, I hope I'm not muted. Let's see. All right. I think You're not I'm muted, up. you're fine. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah. I saw a mute button come up, thank you. Uh, so the birds like to eat in these major group seeds, fruits and berries, as we saw the cedar wax wings. Uh, they also like nuts. There, many like nectar. But primarily the birds like insects and spiders. And in that insect area, they like to eat caterpillars. In particular, their nestlings, the very young birds like to eat caterpillar. Much like human, human children, human babies, they don't start out with steak and potatoes. No, we're going to feed them something uh, liquid or very soft when they're very young. Same thing with nestlings, which are the baby birds without feathers. They can't eat solid foods yet. So their parents are feeding them caterpillars and insects, but caterpillars primarily. And if you thought feeding young human infants was uh, uh, overwhelming, these all eat about every 20 minutes. So those parents are quite busy. And these are the same cardinals you saw in the opening slide. They are living in a rose bush, a standard rose bush that was right outside our bedroom window. Now, how I know and how you can know more details about the birds in, in your garden is an author, a contemporary. His name is Doug Tellamy. If he's ever in town, please go see him. He'll t tell you or explain in his books as well as his lectures how the circle of life, the uh, food chain is being disrupted by, by people, by the population expanding, and about our poor practices in designing our yards and taking away native plants. Native plants are needed in this food circle because the smallest of them, the smallest insects like the caterpillars, they want to eat the native plants and in turn, the birds and other wildlife want to eat along this food chain. So without your native plants, you're really sunk. And because we've been removing so much of the habitat of wildlife, just to show for uh, birds there, he quoted in 2016 that uh, there are 1.5 billion, yes, billion fewer birds compared to 40 years ago. So we need to take care of our planet ourselves and the wildlife. So what exactly is meant by native plants? Well, native plants are going to be indigenous to their area. They like the weather conditions and they like the soil conditions and they like uh, everything, uh, the other nature around them. They're uh, complementary to each other. We'll see more and we'll look at examples as we go through. What about Texas native plants? How do I even get started? This is going to be overwhelming. I don't know where to go. Well, fortunately, we have the native plants for the North Texas birds available from the Audubon Society, audubon.org. You can put in your zip code to be that specific to find out which native plants are good for your area, good for you because they're easier to take care of adapting to the low water conditions for one, as well as what is going to be good for the birds and other wildlife. This is so uh, convenient to use. You can filter also by type of plant that you want. So if you want a tree as opposed to something uh, flowering or shrub or even a ground cover, you can specify. You can also say, hey, you know, I heard those cedar wax wings like berries. So show me things that provide that kind of plant resource. Or you can look by type of bird and find out more details about that bird. I'm gonna drill in by example. 
for my zip code here in Flower Mound. And I'm looking at the deciduous holly. And uh, we commonly call this a possum holly. And it is what those cedar wax wings were feeding on. And um, I heard recently that possum haw is not exactly native to this specific area, but uh, Sally Wasowski, who is uh, author of many native Texas plant books, says it has naturalized in this cross timbers area. It's more indigenous to the East Texas area. And it is growing in my front yard, as you saw, and quite happy here. And the cedar waxwings, they just love it. So drilling down a little more, let's look at the, some other birds. Uh, I picked cardinals here because they're so bright and happy. And I think everyone welcomes the cardinals. Now, the males are the bright red ones. And the tawny colored one with some red accents are, are the mamas, are the females. And this will tell you far more about them, their habitat of where they like to hang out. And you'll also note that they may behave differently in the eastern United States than they do down here in the southwest. Down here, they're going to be in tall brush, streamside thickets, and they'll even live in a desert if there are mesquites around. There's even more information about them and happy for us is you can take this with you. It's available through the App Store, so you can carry this with you on your phone. You'll notice too that the text is adapted from Ken Kaufman, Lives of North American Birds. If you're old fashioned like I am and prefer one of the hand reference guides, I highly recommend the Ken Kaufman book. I was blessed enough to meet him in person and tour around White Rock Lake with him. His books are easy to follow and you can see that evidence of his knowledge, passing it on to you when you use the app. The app I did check is free, but of course the Audubon Society would uh, allow, would, would really welcome our uh, contributions because they are a nonprofit. Let's look a little more about that cardinal. And this is the type of information that you can see, the feeding behavior where they're hanging out, they do like to eat from bird feeders, how they rear their young. For diet, mostly a seed eater, uh, as well as they do like their insects. Yes, caterpillars, but they like things in the bugs slash beetles area. So they uh, are getting their protein and, and nutrition. And it will also tell you about their nesting habits of male and female. And they're not nesting high up in trees. As I said, they're in a standard rose bush right outside my window. We also have, have had them nest in uh, some coral honeysuckles, and I'll show those in an example coming up, the plant, not the nest that I had in there. If you'd like to take a convenient reference list with you, the Texas Audubon Society there, tx.audubon.org, has a beautiful two-page PDF. And it is split by the types of food these birds are going to like to eat. The caterpillar plants are shown there. And it does include a lot of trees, as well as those that like the fruits. We have uh, trees there, as well as some shorter uh, items, as well as vines like Virginia creeper. And uh, we have nuts and seeds for the fall and winter and the nectar producing plants. More than hummingbirds like nectars, orioles, tanagers, mockingbirds, as well as other insects like them. And for plants that are attracting insects, insects attract birds. So it's very good in our food chain. And we'll look at some of these plants specifically. But uh, take a little note of that from the texasaudubon.org you can get this plant list to take it with you. Let's look at the different types of plants, trees. Now, among the trees across the United States, Doug Tellamy tells us that oaks provide the most food. Caterpillars like to munch on them. If you know they're a big tree, I bet you hardly even notice uh, some of the damage that they're doing because the birds are taking care of the caterpillar population. They also are the home for many insects and they produce nuts, the acorns that can be eaten by 
the birds as well as other wildlife. Another function of the trees is to provide shelter as well as some water because birds can actually drink off of the leaves. They are collecting moisture as well as in the winter, uh, the melting residue, the melting moisture, they can collect moisture from the trees themselves. Now, I in particular picked a, an oak in my front yard here, and this is one that does not lose its leaves immediately in the winter. And that phenomenon, it's not a dying tree, it's actually usually common in young trees, is called marcescence or they're referred to as ever siduous. Now this is good for the birds. It's a nice place to hang out on cold winter's days. And depending on where they are, it also can act as a windbreak on windy days. The belief on why these trees, young oaks in particular, hang on to their leaves is that they are defending themselves against munching wildlife that might want to chew on their bark or their limbs, their low limbs. The other theory is that they hang on to their leaves as youngsters, not dropping them until later in the season. The other leaves are already composting down and they wait until very late spring to produce their own compost, uh, their own mulching system by dropping the leaves late. That's also very good for birds that are looking for nest making materials early in the spring. So young oak trees, are not in trouble necessarily when they do maintain their leaves, as you see with this one, that um, it's called marcescence or eversiduous. A slash tree slash shrub is the possum hall holly that I showed you. Now it loses its leaves over the, the winter, and that's where you see the decidua there, Ilex decidua. Its close cousin, the Yopon holly, that is indigenous to this particular area, uh, while the birds like cedar waxwings munch away on their berries, people wouldn't want to. Uh, the difference with the Yopon holly is it has leaves, and the name will tell you, Ilex vomitoria, that they're not going to be very digestible by humans. So both of these are excellent in the area. They really are of self-care and can do with little wa water after they're established. Loved by many birds and many insects. Another shrub I saw in my yard and then I got curious the other way, is this Texas mountain laurel good for birds? So I did some research like you may want to do also. And this Texas mountain laurel is good for nectaring. It has beautiful purple blooms and they smell wonderful in the spring. And those will turn into pea pods. The, uh, the shrub is part of the pea family. Unfortunately, it is otherwise poisonous to wildlife and birds and people. However, if I'm a bird and I'm trying to escape a predator or hide from anyone in the backyard, I may duck into this lovely shrub-like structure there. And it is evergreen, it's green. Uh, I took this picture today. So it's green year round. And uh, I know many of Sparrow, a wren, they've been in there, they scare the bejeebers out of me when I walk by and they flutter away. So it's good for a sheltering mechanism also. Another lovely shrub that is quite thrilling and attracts not just hummingbirds for its trumpet-like flowers, but many bees, flies, butterflies, flame acanthus, a lovely, lovely shrub indigenous to the area. And you will enjoy watching the various visitors come to this. And it has a very long bloom time. Mine start in, in May, late May, and they go right up to uh, the the fall time period, the frost, and they will bloom even during the heat of the summer. It loves the sun, just loves the sun. Now, one shrub that doesn't care for shrubs, the first sun, excuse me, uh, is the American beauty berry. Great understory. And look at those berries. Look delicious. We can, as humans, make jellies out of them. 
You have to put a lot of sweetener in there, but you can make jelly out of them, jams. And uh, the birds do like them. They'll come in the fall. I've even seen robins eating on these American Beauty berries. If the frost hits them, if they get real cold and shrivel up, doesn't matter. They turn into Beauty Berry raisins. And I've seen many birds eat them after they are shriveled. So very good for um, the duration of their uh, berry producing phase from very late fall when they turn purple like this or very late summer right through the spring. The blossoms uh, are a little, uh, they're very small and not notable. And there are insects that will come and hover around them, of course, pollinate them. Now those insects, those are attractive to the birds in the summer. Now vines, often don't think about vines as being a source for birds. I already mentioned that we've had nesting cardinals in the coral honeysuckle, absolutely. And you see those trumpets, trumpet flowers? Well, they attract the hummingbirds and also butterflies, but hummingbirds just love them. So good, good uh, uh, also for a wind cover. But note what Doug Tellamy is telling us about this, uh, that about hummingbirds getting nectar. Actually, hummingbirds like and need nectar, but 80% of their diet is really insects and spiders. I have seen hummingbirds snatch gnats and flying insects right out of the air. And that is cool, it's really cool. I mean, they're fast, they go forward, backward, up, down and around, and they snatch insects right in the air. So absolutely, they like the, the nectar that you may even be putting out for them in feeders, but they're getting the majority of their protein, their diet, from those insects. Another vine is the passion vine. And you can tell this is the native because it has the three lobes on the uh, leaf. And it's not necessarily eaten by the birds directly, but it does attract caterpillars for the Gulf fritillary. And I hope I have the right name on this, the passive flora lutea. This is a very tiny little yellow uh, passion flower and it does get fruits. But I will say that every year it's cleared, I mean eaten to the, to the very vine stem itself, comes back every year. A big favorite of those caterpillars. Don't forget the grasses either. This is little blue stem in my yard. Uh, the picture on the left happens to have a big red sage, another native plant, uh, coupled right next to it. It is a trumpet kind of flower for the big red sage, so another nectarine flower. But that little blue stem, it just takes my breath away. It is the most gorgeous blue-green color. And I have another picture coming up, but this particular shot was taken in late September. Well, by October, it is putting on its seed heads. And this picture on the right I took this week, just to show you that it turns color and has the seed heads and is a great food source for the birds in the winter. However, it was bright and sunny when I took it and it, the picture doesn't do it justice. These little blue stems turn a copper color and they are gorgeous in a field. They are also gorgeous in the spring in the field. This is the field in my backyard with the blue green little blue stem. And I know there's also a large blue stem, but the little blue stem, don't be fooled, it comes probably a good four feet. It's almost up to my chin. So it's a, a lovely plant and um, I like to walk through it and just run my fingers through it. Native to the area, absolutely. This one is growing in very sandy soil in the backyard. I know the birds like it because this one is in the front yard and it literally flew in. Either um, another critter pooped it or I really think a, a bird brought it through droppings that it ended up and planted itself in the front yard. Other grasses are providing winter foods. So uh, they're very lovely to look at in the winter with the grass plumes. Don't cut them down too soon. They're a nice food source 
uh, during the winter months. Speaking of that, we have flowers and you think like, I've never seen a bird on a purple cone flower. Well, they are hosting many insects and we're in that food chain, remember? So the birds will be eating those insects. And don't cut them down too soon because their seed pods are an excellent source of food for the birds. And you don't wanna cut down your native plants too soon because they are also the habitat for many insects. Those are going to be next season's bird food. It, it, it's, it is quite delightful to look out. I think it's delightful seeing the, the frost hit the different seed heads and just watching them turn. And of course, watching the visitors, the, the birds that come and cling on to them. Um, sparrows, wrens, they're just loving them. Uh, finches, and, and they'll just come and chew on them and, and, and give us a, a, an entertainment, a free entertainment out the back window. Ground covers too. Ground covers, and I, I never, I need to take a picture of the cedar sedge in my backyard. Uh, it grows early in the spring and flowers, as you can see. And as soon as it does that, there's those seed heads that are going to be yummy. And they're also going to die back by summer. So there's long, slender sedges have edges, the long, slender, uh, grass blades, grass-like blades, because sedges have edges, uh, they can be used for nesting material. Very, very important, the cedar sedge. Other things that may be considered weeds, well, they're lovely to look at and good eating for either insects or birds. And here are two that grow in my yard. Actually, there's a more in the multiple picture there. In the upper right, is that Illinois bundle flower. Look at those seed heads, aren't those glorious? I will tell you it's lovely, it's feather-like, a nice plant, but once those roots get in there, uh, you better have it in an area that you like uh, because they, they, they are a little difficult to dig out, particularly if they are in clay, but I think they're beautiful. Very feather-like, very fern-like. And then more to the center, the croton is the, the a plant in the front here, I was getting my mouse going, and uh, it is a host plant to certain butterflies. And uh, it, I think it's lovely. It's more of a blue green color than a true green. I think of it as a very giant uh, lamb's ear. It's not related, but it's very giant like that. And with the blue green leaves and the, and the little tassels that come on it. Now to the left behind it, you see kidney wood attracts many, many different insects. Birds can uh, sit in it also. And uh, this is actually what they, birds like to hang out in messy areas. It gives them a little camo area for, and it, uh, they know insects are in the area. So they do like to hang out among the hogwart, the bundle, the bundle flower. Uh, they like a habitat that's more natural to them rather than the prune backs, different shrubs and boxed items and cut grasses. They, they like it, they like it willy nilly. You do want to avoid pesticides. Pesticides include insecticides that are going to kill the insects that the birds would be eating. It also could kill the birds or damage the birds themselves. One in particular that has been used lately, more in agriculture, but it is used in horticulture and home use, are neonicanoids or neonics for short. These, this is actually done as a uh, seed coating and it becomes systemic, being that when the seeds grow, this chemical, the neonicanoid, grows up through the plants. So if insects try to eat it, uh, they, they will die. Unfortunately, it is not all absorbed by the plants. And much of it does end up in the soil and in runoff of the, the water to our waterways. Plus, you and I are, are eating this neonicanoid too when it's applied to vegetables. So it's killing off a lot of the food supplies for the birds. And if birds themselves ingest the seeds, 
It can be fatal with one or two seeds to particularly the small birds like the sparrows um, and, and the wrens and those that are going to be ground feeders too. So be, be very cautious, read the labels. Uh, if you're doing a systemic type of uh, insecticide killer, a pesticide like for trees and shrubs, be wary because it could be dangerous in the long run. Weed killers in general, the granules that are put on lawns can be ingested by birds and it's also affecting killing or, or modifying the, the habitats for grubs, worms, and ground insects. Again, harmful to the food chain. I did pull this one up. Uh, it is from, oh, it's from one of the universities. And I think it's, uh, uh, I'm not gonna say, oh, you can watch it, you have the YouTube link here. And basically it's saying, uh, how to avoid them as a person not buying the pro not buying the actual nicanoid, but uh, buy organic to avoid getting nicanoid based produce. Now bird feeders. This is controversial. What? Bird feeding is kind of an industry. It's an entertainment. But some say bird feeding shouldn't be done. You should not supply the birds with uh, bird seed. Or, or any other feed because they should be out there foraging for themselves. Well, um, I can see both sides of the story, but I, as I said, I find them quite entertaining myself. And you know, there are days, particularly in the winter, where they need a little help because the insects certainly aren't hanging out when you know, you've got a below freezing day. So this is a, a blue jay coming to a feeder in my backyard. Now for the feeders themselves, I do supply them with safflower. Uh, supposedly squirrels do not like safflower. Some squirrels in my yard cannot read. So we, it does keep down um, many other squirrels, but not all. And I do also put out suets. Uh, suets attract many of the woodpeckers and, and in that family. So I do like uh, having a, an extra amount of nutrition available for them in the cold weather months. I do take down the feeders. I supply uh, baskets of flowers on the hooks, which again are good as a feed, uh, attracting insects and uh, birds come by even for the moisture in them. I replace a lot of them with uh, the flower baskets as well as I do put out the hummingbird nectar feeders. I use uh, just plain sugar, a four to one ratio with water. I don't put much in it at a time because I change it out regularly so it doesn't uh, go bad and cause them any, any damage or get them drunk or anything. So bird feeders, controversial. The other thing too is I don't fill my feeders very much because I don't wanna attract any uh, rodent population. We are blessed with having many morning doves and they usually take care of the ground area or juncos come in and uh, clean up the ground for anybody that was messy and spilled from the feeders. Now give me shelter, let's look at shelter. This, by the way, my son built one just like it uh, and it was one of the Home Depot Kids Make It projects. So it's uh, good for the small birds like uh, wrens like it. This uh, particular graphic is from Montana. Though it looks like an English garden to me, it expressed what birds need and gave some very good examples. Though the birds are not proportional to the vegetation that is in the picture. Let's take a deeper look at the shelter requirements. This graphic, a Habitat Layers, is produced by the Texas Parks and Wildlife and just a lovely example of what trees as well as the other vegetation are providing as a habitat. Uh, the above canopy area is those larger birds like vultures, hawks, swallows, and swifts. The mid, the can excuse me, the canopy area, you're gonna find your owls. There's actually one, if you look closely, there's one hanging out here in the canopy area. The owls, the woodpeckers, et cetera, they're hanging out in the, the upper area of the trees. The mid stories, there are your songbirds in that area. 
So I will say that my cardinals do favor in my yard, the understories like the mockingbirds and the bluebirds, the wrens and the doves. My cardinals tend to favor the understory as well as my doves do like to go mid-story. Ground cover you see there, some of the smaller birds as well as the waterfowl and wading birds. Excellent graphic. Below you'll see examples of the specific species that belong in these different areas. These are providing nesting and roosting, security for cover up, for covering, weather protection, hot, cold, wind, rain, as well as they are a food source. So take a picture of that or give it a Google. It's from the Texas uh, Parks and Wildlife. This is a picture from my backyard showing that diversity in the types of trees that you have. The evergreens are going to provide shelter from the weather as well as predators and also a good nesting area for many different species. It's also a good year round food source. And as I said, the camo from the predator. And you're probably thinking, great, my yard isn't big enough for all of those trees. Well, maybe there already is uh, an evergreen in the neighbor's yard. And maybe another neighbor, look around the neighborhood, another neighbor has some cedar elms. And there in the center, you can provide the red bud if you have a small yard. And that is a native red bud. And you see it there in the spring. And when I showed you the picture of the um, little blue stem, the little blue stem is just coming up in the foreground there. It's not quite up yet up yet in, in this backyard. So it's completely native. And the diversity is good for the entire bird, insect, wildlife population. So don't have a mono, a mono type of culture. Do diversify and borrow from what you see in the neighborhood and complement it. I just put this one in to say, uh, if you're thinking camo, this blue heron did not fool me. I know one from the other. And as far as predators, I'll let the dog out who barked and it flew away and protected our fish. Now nesting, we've been through trees and shrubs and vines. And uh, let's talk a little bit about the other two on there, ground and boxes. This is the cardinal from the opening um, with the one with the attitude. That is the same cardinal in the rose bush. Snags. If you have a tree in your yard that has a gaping hole in it, it's not necessarily going to die. It might be a great place for a, a, a habitat for nesting of different kinds of birds. Let them move in. And if the tree is dead, and if you don't mind it, it might be structurally a very uh, funky looking to you and you like the way it, it, it's just hanging in there, let it up. I mean, it's great. Dead trees that are left to decompose naturally can be quite attractive, especially to birds and wildlife. And uh, you, can, you can use it for ornamental purposes also. You might want to hang some art objects on it. Let, let it be, let it be if you can. Uh, those are referred to as snags. Now, if uh, part of it or all of it falls to the ground, it becomes a log and logs are very useful as a habitat also. And it's showing that the dead materials from the forest uh, can, can or do help at least one fifth of the animals in the ecosystems. If you wanna help them out further on the ground level, you can gather up the dead parts, the, the branches and, and make a thicket for them. And this is what we do. We gather up a thicket and fortunately we have a large enough yard that we can put them in a discrete area in the far back. And I'm sure many critters live in there uh, besides the birds as well as other insects are making their home there. Bird houses. On the left, we have some bird houses that are in my backyard. We have the Purple Mountain House, uh, which looks like a, a, a condominium for birds in the front foreground, uh, right by Penny. That's Penny the dog, who makes a debut in 
almost all of my talks because she photo bombs. Well, that is a birdhouse beside, uh, excuse me, a bluebird house beside Penny. It does have a baffle underneath and it has a small cage around the opening uh, to protect the birds and only allow birds of a certain size in, as well as keep other predators, snakes, raccoons, etc., away from their eggs. And in the distance, there is another bluebird box. There's actually six um, in the backyard. And you'll see that these are out in the open area that are around the side of the woods uh, in the meadow type of area, and they are in the sun. Now on the right picture, the right side, uh, up in the tree, there is an owl box. By contrast, that owl box is up a lot higher, not as high as the Purple Martin house, but it needs to be X feet off the ground. It has a different size hole. And it does like to be in the woods. The owls like to be in the woods. And it, they do like to have a very close nearby water source. And that's why you see that bird bath in front of it. Now, uh, we could go on and have an entire presentation on the making and hanging and positioning of these bird houses. I suggest you do research them individually for what you'd like to attract. And, uh, I think it's great having the birdhouses as, as most do because we have destroyed a lot of their natural nesting habitats. So it is good to provide them an alternate habitat safe shelter for their young. And uh, in the case of the purple martins, if you want to uh, eradicate a lot of flying insects, those purple martins are going to do it for you. So I invite you to, to do uh, get the birdhouses of different shapes and sizes to attract the different birds that you would like to have in your yard. I can't help myself. I do peek at them. I stick my camera in, and these are some youngins that have come to the bluebird houses. Now, though they're made for bluebirds, you can't convince the rest of uh, the birds in the yard. We've had tufted titmouse birds in, in, in one. Uh, every year, the one that's out there in the, uh, by the hickory tree that you saw with Penny, let me go back, oops, go backwards. I can't go back. Oh. This far one is consistently chickadees, Carolina chickadees, as well as some of the other ones. So some of the other species of birds do come in and uh, use these boxes, and I don't mind. I do clean them out every year. If you're worried about uh, wasps building in them, I had that problem, but now uh, from further reading, what I do is I rub the roof, the inside roof with soap. I use ivory soap and rub the inside. I don't know if it's the smell, the slipperiness. Uh, I no longer get the, the wasps building on inside the, um, the bird houses, so I, I suggest you try that. Now here's a little early bird. I called him an early bird. He he escaped early. He could not fly yet. Uh, Mama and Pop Chickadee were just <laughs> chasing me around, and I was afraid that Penny the dog was going to have a snack. So I did pick him up. I initially picked him up with a glove, but to handle him more gently, I just used my hand. I did put him in back in the box. I counted everyone when I was in there and they all stayed in there the two days. So not if, they, if I find them on the Monday, they all left on Wednesday. He was just out a wee little bit too early. And if, um, if the dog didn't get them, I feared another predator would. So back in the box I went, they said, some say that, oh, you can't touch them, the mothers. Oh no, mom and dad were perfectly fine with it. And uh, I, I knew from watching and counting the number of birds that were coming out that this one too survived. So sometimes they escape and a little too early. I think he got on his sibling's shoulders and climbed out. Our last area is water. And uh, this is just taken from uh, you know, a marketing kind of thing that you can get a water feeder. And uh, this is showing birds coming to it. So try it. We have a small pond in the backyard. And as we opened with the cedar wax wings, here's the cedar wax wings coming to drink, as well as there are birds that like water for bathing. 
I think they bathe either to uh, just be clean, maybe to get rid of insects or something that they may have been flying around or into, uh, or they're, they're doing it to cool off in the summer, not sure. I, I've never interviewed them, but I know that the Blue Jays in particular like to splash around in the bird bath. Also water could be a source for nest building. Many of the birds use water and make uh, like a mud paste to hold their nests together. Here's another shot of those uh, cedar waxwings, which as I mentioned, are a migratory bird. They come in groups of 50, maybe 75, some stand, they send out a scout and then some stand watch. And then uh, they all dive in to either to get a drink and or uh, visit the different fairies in the yard. It's very thrilling, uh, just wonderful when they do make a stop. If you're providing water in a bird bath, keep it clean. Uh, you want to avoid hosting mosquito larvae. It's, uh, mosquitoes aren't a problem in the pond because it's moving water and I also do have fish in there. But in the case of a bird bath, it's probably good only up to four days, 96 hours from the time a mosquito would lay its eggs until it's available to hatch and fly away and do, it, do, its, uh, do its thing. So clean them out, clean your bird bath. I periodically, once or twice a year, empty the whole thing out and I do give it a, a Clorox kind of watch, a chlorine be bleach wash and rinse it thoroughly because it is a very porous material being the concrete, I do clean it thoroughly and then uh, I fill it. It's filled often with rainwater. Uh, I tip it and refill it with uh, tap water uh, to keep water available for them year round. That's all I had. I hope you got some ideas. This last bird is not a songbird, but this is a Mississippi kite and he is in a cedar elm in the front yard. They are a migratory bird. They come in the summer and nest here in the summer. I hope you get some in your neighborhood. So I'm going to ask Cheryl if we have any questions in the queue and I'll ask yes. you. You do? We did have one question about the neonicotinoid uh, pesticides and if that type of pesticide is some that you might see on tags at the box stores. Um, I, what I had done was put in, um, you know, what the typical active ingredients that are neonicotinoids that you might find in a um, systemic pesticide in a box store and what to look for. Um, those include, um, and I may not be able to say them all because <laughs> they have a lot of consonants, but um, imidacloprid uh, is common. You might also see acetamiprid, uh, dinotefurin, theamoxetham, and uh, clothianidin. If you look for any of those uh, active ingredients on a systemic pesticide, and it will say it's systemic, which means that it is pulled up into the vascular system of the plant. Um, those um, are the uh, active ingredients that you might find that are um, harmful to birds, and they can be very harmful to honeybees as well. Correct. Yes, and that, that's the key thing, a systemic killer. And if you read the label, and I really caution everyone to completely read the label, each and every product that you buy, it will clearly say not to apply anywhere near any um, vegetable products that you are doing, vegetables, fruit, uh, vegetables and berry bushes, and it will tell you how close to get it. It can be used with some fruit trees, very, very scary, because as a systemic, like you say, it's pulling up into the vascular system of that plant. So very scary neonicotinoids. Thanks for looking that up, Cheryl. I wanted to yes. open also for Cecil. Cecil, do you have any comments? If you're on mute, you are, can I mute yourself, Cecil? Sure. 
not hearing from Cecil, but I will say again, he was absolutely my inspiration for putting this together. So I adapted from his long presentation that he did from Ollie uh, using those uh, core requirements for the food, the shelter, uh, and the water. And I, I supplemented it with pictures from the yard. So thank you very much, Cecil, for being my inspiration. I think it's OK. Um, do I have it back as all? Oh, you were on. OK, I think you're available. You're coming off and on mute there, Cecil. stay off a second i would like to say that um, you uh, touched a lot of points that i don't ever do which was terrific to me because i learned a lot from it uh, oh, <laughs> well uh, i'm true uh, you know you, you set a real high standard for people to follow you so it's going to be a tough tough follow uh, i can't think of a thing in the in terms of uh, native plants that that, that you missed and every, everything was right there for people to see and it was terrific to hear from somebody else besides me and boy that's great thank you cecil any other questions out there cheryl can you see anything else nope just a lot of kudos for doing a terrific job and your beautiful photos oh thank you uh, i do have up on the screen if anyone has subsequent questions on this topic or anything else, we have the Denton County Master Gardener Association Help Desk available 24 by 7 via email. They also have a phone if you want to try calling them, uh, but the phone number now accepts texts as well as you can up, uh, take pictures and send it in saying, what's this? So uh, we welcome you to bring us your, your questions to the Help Desk. We do hope to see you too at our plant sale and at the uh, Master Gardener tour, and I'll switch back to that, and I'll leave you with that on the screen. Share. And Linda, we did have one last late question about, um, and I'm not sure it was from Becky Bertoni about the use of cedar sedge. Becky, can you elaborate a little bit about what your question is? You can unmute if you like. Uh, I just uh, missed that section, and uh, I know cedar sedge was mentioned for for the birds. Yes, cedar sedge was shown as a ground cover, which it definitely ah. is. It looks like a grass, but sedges have edges, so it's uh, low growing, doesn't get very tall. <laughs> It, it comes up in the spring and uh, it puts up its own uh, uh, shoot, uh, seed shoots, which are good as a food item. And it does die back for summer, but because of its blades, the blades can be used in nesting uh, at, very conveniently at that time for, for birds nesting in the late spring. Okay, wow, lots of uses, thank you. Mm -hmm. It's, it grows in the shade too. Mine grows in the shade. So I love it because it gives me green underneath the trees and it does act as a good erosion control in, up in my woods that's on a hill. Anything else? If there's nothing else, I'll close for the day and thank you all for attending. Thank you so much, Linda. DCMGA, thank you so much. Yes, I enjoyed it.